is how even in early modernity, um, knowledge about the natural world was also central to ideas about political power. So that's that's why they go into the works by Thomas Hobbes, the Le Leviathan. The Leviathan is the one who controls power in society, but also the ones, one who controls what counts as legitimate knowledge. Maybe uh, not that central until, until more recently is, is the idea that uh, the definition of what counts as knowledge is also important for defining ignorance. So ignorance is relative to knowledge, because if I say that you are knowledgeable, but you have a different kind of knowledge, then maybe I, I brand you as ignorant, right? Or, or your kind of knowledge as, as not authentic or, or the real kind of knowledge. So ignorance is also a kind of power by by being able to define in public and in, in public controversies who is knowledgeable and who is ignorant. And then going even closer to the, to the present, we also see that the strategic effort to manipulate ignorance and, and sometimes calling it knowledge has also become a topic. So we wrote a book a few years ago, me and some colleagues about, about post-truth. Uh, so this is where you get this kind of, with a post-truth condition, you get strategic manipula manipulation also of, of ignorance, planting ignorance, maybe calling it knowledge. Okay, so in many controversies over knowledge and ignorance, we still find this question, which I will focus on and which I agreed with uh, uh, Jan and Christine when we, when we prepare this session, this idea that science is value neutral, which we frequently hear in, in controversies over uh, knowledge, over ignorance. Um, the idea of value neutrality and objectivity of science is a quite old one, as I said, and it's an important one. It played an important role uh, back in early modernity when there was a lot of uh, wars in Europe. There was this idea that you could have an impartial sphere that was outside of the war zone, outside of immediate uh, interest, was important. So you could have the laboratory, you could have uh, scientific uh, impartial calculation in, in the natural sciences, but you could also have in society, you could have impartiality of the courts, right? There are good reasons for saying that impartiality of the courts or neutrality of the court preceded the idea of, uh, of scientific neutrality. I'm sorry. <laughs> you want Continue to? Just yeah. Uh, okay. So, I mean, there are good reasons for having these ideas, but uh, coming closer to the present, there are also, well, you could also say maybe these ideas have been taken over by special interests or somehow perverted. So you, you get this idea that by, by alluding to the neutrality and objectivity of scientific fact, you can kind of kill a political issue because you say this is not a political question, it's a scientific one. And we actually have the facts. Here they are. Forget about it. Discussion over. So this is what we call depoliticization, right? And as I will say, in most cases, depoliticization is uh, is you know, it's, it's a strategy, it's a political and rhetorical strategy, it's not, it's not actually grounded in science itself, in fact, it's not itself a fact. You could also go too far in the other direction where any kind of scientific claim becomes a political claim, but if that happens, well, you have these debates over uh, relativism in science, so anything goes, and if we get to that point, we as scientists, we are not uh, in a good position because then we have actually uh, deleted our own claim to authority, right? So there has to be some kind of some kind of claim to impartiality, some kind of claim to to authority involved in in science, definitely. So these are two two extremes, you could say. We need to avoid both. Politicization and depoliticization and overpoliticization. 
Okay, so let's go directly into uh, two cases where, where we see these kinds of um, strategies at work. Um, in, and I've chosen Norwegian ones. It's, they are not cases that I have studied uh, very much myself. I take much of it from, from uh, our program, in our master program in sustainability, which I coordinate, where I teach. So the, the first case here is um, this controversy over uh, the building of windmills at Fosen. I think most of you will be familiar with it, but it's, it's, it's a struggle over land, whether the land should be used to construct windmills or whether the land should belong to the indigenous Sami people and their reindeer herding, right? And the case has been going on. It has been centered around a uh, process of license licensing granted by the authorities to developers. Been going on since at least 2008, I think, where from the very beginning, the indigenous, the Sami communities, they have tried to contest the, the impact assessments that have been used by the government, by the regulators, right? So there has been this fight that they did not, they were not heard, the Sami people and, and the, the ecological activists with, with whom they, they collaborated. You can see some of them here. There was Mutvin, uh, and there was Natuvan Fubunda, and there was the uh, Curious Association. They were part of this coalition that have, has been trying, becoming more and more vocal. And it ended, of course, as we know, with a, with a, a ruling in the Supreme Court stating that the, the Sami um, the Sami uh, human rights activists were basically right that their um, their human rights had been breached. So against this, there was the the uh, perspective put forward by the Norwegian government, and it was it, it went into the licensing process in terms of of uh, impact assessments, right? Uh, and and this is where some of the activists and the and and the, the, the Sami uh, activists as well were saying that their kind of indigenous knowledge had never been taken into account in this process. It, um, it had been deleted because it does not fit within a process that is focusing on uh, engineering, science, management, and, and, and legal regulations, basically. Whereas it should have been. Now we know it should have been, but now it's a bit too late because now we have a huge technical infrastructure already constructed and we don't know exactly how to get rid of it although we know that is also in breach of fundamental rights and the constitution so we uh, and of course we had in this process uh, the argument put forward about about neutrality and objectivity of the expertise that was the um, the, the regulators <clears throat> Uh, so they would say analysis of technical economic suitability and, and environmental and societal interests throughout the country. That's what they have been carrying out. They claim these assessments involve an inevitable weighting of different interests and how wind power affects them. Evaluation has been carried out through professional judgment. And, and they stated that this could have a conflict mitigating effect. This was in 2019. Turns out they were not right. And whereas, of course, the activists here, the tourist association, would uh, strongly contest this. Um, they said that, again, their kind of knowledge was not taken into account. Knowledge that would uh, value, uh, you know, the local environment, the practices of the, of the Sami reindeer herders <clears throat> and so on. Okay, so a different case. that we also see playing out these days and it's much more happening right now. The case is actually building, right? It's the, it's the uh, struggle uh, of, for assessing the possible impacts of deep sea mining in, on the continental shelf. Uh, and here we have also two kinds of coalitions that are standing one against the other. Uh, there is an impact assessment procedure that has been instigated by the Ministry of Oil and Energy with strong support by um, from industry, and then we have our colleagues uh, in in uh, marine science uh, here at the University of Bergen and other places, 
the Institute of Marine Research, and many of them are saying that uh, the ecological perspective, the vulnerability of, of, um, of deep sea ecological life has not been properly understood. This, this is possibly sites where, of origin of, of, of the existence of life on this planet. They are not properly understood. They are very, uh, they exist on very, um, at very deep uh, levels. So it's, it's hard to actually get access and to understand this process properly. But simultaneously, the impact assessment led by the government and by industry uh, wants to start to uh, extract uh, the, the process of extraction, right? So again, uh, or quoting from the, from the impact assessment from the government, assessments of effects on natural conditions mm -hmm. and the environment is done on a general basis related to, re related to research type, various types of technological solutions for extraction and associated activity. This approach has been chosen to cover the range of possibilities within technologies and scope of business. So we see here that actually the fundamental parameter for assessing the negative impacts are grounded in technological possibility and, and business opportunity more than um, uh, ecological uh, vulnerability and, 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 and the more ecological perspectives. So we see that we have been, in terms of theory, we are moving from what has been known as the precautionary principle. If there is a risk, to the environment or to society, we should not do it. And, and, and those who claim that we should make an intervention, they need to make good. They need to explain to us why we still should do it, why the risk is acceptable. But then as of late, we have in, at least in the more theoretical parts of the literature, uh, we have an articulation of the, something called the pro-actionary principle. Uh, the EU has, um, has uh, its own version of it, which is called the innovation principle. So you always need to take, make a fundamental assessment about what could be the potential impacts on innovation. You need to wrap up. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I have one slide, so that's, that's fine. Um, so the burden of proof is on those who want to, to, to um, uh, what to argue that 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 technological innovation is is uh, not warranted. So uh, we see here then that in both of these cases, uh, the the kind of scientific perspectives that could be brought to bear on these on the two conflicts is very wide. There are many relevant ways of knowing that could be brought to bear on the case, such as indigenous knowledge. The knowledge by by the tourist association and the, and the and the environmental movement in the Fusion case and in the deep sea mining case, the ecological uh, marine ecology perspective is being more or less closed out. So, still the claim to objectivity and expertise and neutrality is being uh, rolled out to produce um, legitimacy of the of the decision, but. But the decisions are really based more on the technological capacity to make some kind of intervention into, into uh, nature than the, the, the idea of some kind of impartial scientific knowledge. So we have moved very much from a paradigm that is based on some kind of impartial science to one that is based more on what we can do technologically. And this, uh, this also comes to frame the, the policy interventions that are being uh, taken. So this means that as activists, we sh we, I don't think we sh can any longer focus too much on producing more facts about the situation. What is needed is to build coalitions uh, across science, society, and so on, that, that can uh, have a more lasting impact on these uh, decisions. We, we saw that in the Fusion case, which actually actually succeeded. So that there was actually broad coalitions on both sides. Okay, I'll uh, stop there. Yeah, thank you. So now we're doing the other one, sorry. Yeah, should I stop sharing perhaps? Yes, maybe you can stop sharing. Yeah.
Okay. And I can also bring it to Yes, we can. So now we'll hear from our second speaker, and PhD and activist in the Scientist Rebellion, Linda Horlan from the Department of Geoscience and Tenu. And thank you for being able to join on such a short notice, Linda. No problem. Thank you so much for inviting me. Just quickly get my screen shared. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, so I'm super grateful that I've been invited to talk about um, Scientist Rebellion today. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, so really quickly, Scientist Rebellion um, are a group of scientists and academics who realize that another scientific article is not enough to address the climate and ecological emergency. So I'll start just by introducing myself a little more. I'm a PhD student, like you said, at NTNU in Trondheim. I'm a geologist, I do structural geology, but I also identify as a terrified researcher and climate activist. And as far as I understand, the audience today isn't necessarily someone that needs to be convinced by how serious the situation is, um, but I still wanna just spend a couple of seconds to talk about how, uh, how afraid I am and why. So you've probably seen this um, this uh, graph here before, that's the global temperature change relative to the average uh, the last or 30 years back in time from 2000. Um, so this is a 150 year uh, curve up until the year here that Scientist Rebellion started. Oops, I can't scroll. Let's see, there we go. Um, and then moving on from that, uh, there's this uh, 2020 paper here that talks about what the temperature will be in the future. So this is the situation, that, the way it's supposed to be today or in 2020. Um, and it shows that 0.8% of the Earth's surface right now is outside of this so-called suitability for human life um, temperature range, which is a mean annual temperature of 29 degrees Celsius or higher. And they project what they uh, think will be the situation 50 years in the future. Uh, and they find a map that looks like this, where 19% of the Earth's surface uh, is so hot that people are forced to leave their homes. And to me, I think it's crazy how much we normalize this type of map and these kinds of findings in papers between one and three billion people will have to leave their homes in this situation here, um, according to what they found in this paper. And just increased temperatures is not the only reason why people will be forced away from their homes. There are so many other things that an, a warming climate means for human population. Um, and we're not only talking about the climate change and, and people being displaced we're actually also talking about this increased inequality in society, destruction of nature, and in many cases, collapse of civilization. And researchers have known about this for decades now, but still don't act as though it's an emergency. And the problem is that solutions exist, but we just don't have world leaders that are willing to make these changes. And from the first World Con Climate Conference in 1979 up until the Paris Agreement, which is like close to 10 years ago now, um, we see that the temperatures just keep on rising. And those of us that see this are getting more and more desperate. And I'm sure many among you are the same. And that is why many places in the world now scientists are advocating for nonviolent civil disobedience as a tool to combat this climate change and to facilitate this change in policy across the world. So I'm just gonna talk a bit about what nonviolent civil disobedience actually is. So these pictures here are from a, a very famous um, civil disobedience action that you probably recognize from the civil rights movement in the US. So civil disobedience is when you purpose, purposefully don't obey laws or police orders, um, often getting arrested or having other 
uh, sometimes very severe consequences for yourself. Um, but you do this to gain awareness for an important cause um, and you usually do it in a very disruptive manner to get the attention needed. Um, but importantly, this is the most efficient way of catalyzing rapid and very large scale societal changes like we saw with the civil rights movement in the US and many other movements worldwide. And then it's also our most powerful democratic tool in many ways. But many people believe that scientists should be neutral and should not display things with emotion like you can probably hear now that I, when I'm talking about these changes and about how terrified I am, it really does scare me. And I think it's difficult to talk about. Um, and as scientists, we're taught to keep this very neutral and very, um, um, how do I say this? You don't uh, add feelings to your scientific findings. But this isn't actually the case historically. We have many examples how, of how scientists have spoken up when they've seen the need to, um, doing more than is traditionally known as their jobs of presenting facts in a neutral way. Um, and why should actually scientists be doing this? Well, in societies, we have a very trusted and respected position in many places, thankfully. Um, and this messenger effect is really very powerful and, and we should use the platform that we have. We should also legitimize other activists. Um, maybe you guys remember this Stop Oliletinga campaign that was making a lot of roadblocks. Uh, this is from a roadblock they did in Trondheim, uh, I think like last summer or 2022. Um, and they got a lot of criticism that they didn't know what they were talking about, that they should get jobs and contribute to society and, and not uh, sit in the streets and disrupt people. Um, but then some of us went out and wrote uh, opinion pieces to say that both actually their methods and their message uh, is backed by scientists. Um, so this platform that we have and the access to media, so media is interested in hearing scientists opinion on these kind of actions um, and we need to use that and like i already mentioned it's an emergency and nobody's going to listen to us if we don't actually act like it is an emergency many would also argue that we actually have a moral obligation to speak up when we see something going terribly terribly wrong it's like this einstein quote with those with the privilege to know also have the duty to act so that's what we're doing in, I think, almost 40 countries now around the world, most of the continents, uh, more than a thousand scientists have participated in civil disobedience to draw attention to the climate catastrophe. And we're also doing this here in Norway. This is a roadblock that Scientist Rebellion set up um, in support of Stop Oli Letinga's actions and the roadblocks that they were doing. And this is the news newspaper article that came from it. Um, and this here is from a slow march that we did um, now just before Christmas in town here. But we don't just get arrested for the climate. We do so many other things. It's really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we do actions that are as effective as possible, that reach as many people as possible. Um, and we're always open to more ideas on how to do things. We really need all hands on deck to be able to solve this. Um, but of course, what gets into the news is uh, usually when we get arrested, which is also why we do it. But we organize climate cafes. They're these public outreach events with a lot of audience participation. They're really fun. Um, we do a lot of legal demonstrations, of course, here are from some both in Trondheim and in Oslo. Um, we've done a death march to commemorate recently extinct species. This was directly after this IPBS report. So that's the International Panel on Biodiversity and Eco Ecosystem Services. Sorry, it's so hard to say. It's like the IPCC, but for um, biodiversity. So they cam came out with this report showing that there had been a 69% reduction in an animal populations over the last 50 years on average, which is another one of these facts that we get used to and normalized, but it's actually astonishing. 
so we put up these tombstones with the different um, species that have been extinct and also the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol um, to sort of show how how the trend is moving. Um, we've done statue Sundays a bit in Trondheim, but also a lot in Oslo, where we blindfolded um, statues and uh, and to show how we're heading into the future blindfolded. Uh, we're closing our eyes instead of listening to the science um, and that we need to speak up. As scientists, we also obviously write a lot. So we've done a lot of different opinion pieces, even some scientific publications. Uh, we attend conferences like this one here. Um, sometimes we also do it uninvited. Uh, so we kind of hold up some banners and, and make our voices heard if we see greenwashing going on. And I also want to shamelessly plug the session later on today where some people from Scientist Rebellion in Trondheim will be doing a workshop here at this conference um, to talk about how to do nonviolent civil disobedience. Um, it's going to be a super good workshop and I definitely recommend as many as possible of you to come. Um, we also collaborate across different environmental organizations. In Trondheim we started this Trendosk Natur og Klimaalliance together with a lot of different um, uh, organizations. It's been really good to just gain more visibility. Um, and finally, I want to bring up some good news, I guess, showing how our work actually pays off from time to time. This year, we won uh, the Communicator of the Year Award from the Natural Sciences faculty at NTNU in Trondheim, which is so huge for us. Um, they, of course, don't uh, like openly endorse the civil disobedience that we do, but but they still are legitimizing the work that we do that is you know, not a part of our actual jobs, um, but to talk about uh, the climate and, and uh, natural emergency. Um, and it also legitimizes other researchers, researchers to speak up um, and to take action, action outside of their day-to-day -day academic work. And interestingly, um, Christina here, um, and she works at the natural sciences faculty, uh, was one of the people that tried to glue themselves to Skrik uh, a little while back. And it's very um, powerful to see how she, as uh, not only a brilliant scientist, but also as an activist, gets recognition from her workplace, not necessarily for this action, but for the work that she does. So finally, I just hope that this has inspired you to take action yourselves. Um, it's possible to do things. Please join us. Um, definitely join our workshop later today. It'll be so much fun and so interesting. Um, but you can reach us these places or scan the QR code. Um, and we really hope that many of you are inspired to roll up your sleeves. Yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you, Linda. Going this to looks like now. move a little bit. <laughs> there, perfect. All right. I can see you. Uh, thank you. And um, maybe you would like to come up here too, so the audience can see you. Yes. So, yeah, this is quite a new technical solution. Can we still test it out? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this is the first run. But, uh, yeah. Can uh, we yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shadi, what? Do you think, yeah, would you care to comment on uh, Linda's presentation first? Okay, well, I, I mean, a bit improvised, of course, but um, but uh, I, I, well, to try to draw a bit of a connection between what I was talking about and what uh, Linda was talking about, I think, um, well, first of all, I, I would say this kind of activism is legitimate and it's required. I think it also follows from what I was saying, because, I, I mean, Together with colleagues, I, I, we said like 10 or 15 years ago that producing more facts will actually not uh, will not stop uh, climate change. I mean, the, there will always also be more uncertainty that is being produced from, from uh, gaining more knowledge about climate change. And so there will always be more doubt and more ignorance will also be uh, produced. And, and so it can always be manipulated by uh, you know, uh, other forces, more uh, right-wing uh, activist forces, perhaps. Uh, so there is a need to take 
action instead of just producing one more scientific paper. Definitely, I agree with that. Um, if 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 I should, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, I think maybe this form of activism, it's possible that it's still mainly intervening in a symbolic level, I have to say. I, I think there is a lot of research on social movements over the last, well, you know, from the Arab Spring and onwards, uh, seeing how actually a lot of activism has not resulted. There has been a lot, a, a strong increase, a sharp increase in the level of activism over the last one or two decades. The, the level of uh, change that is produced by it is, uh, well, you can question it. Yeah. So this is, a, this is, I think there is a need therefore to take this very good um, motivation and the intention to do something which is totally required and maybe, well, maybe learn from other kinds of movements in the past, like the hygiene movement or the labor movement and because there is actually a need to, to build those kind of coalitions that I talked about at the end, which I did not get to talk about so much because I ran out of time, but, <laughs> but to think very deeply about how to organize, how to get organized for efficient action. Um, and, and maybe there is still some, something to be gained in those, in those levels for, for you know, Extinction Rebellion, uh, okay. sci Scientist Rebellion, and so on. I think... Um, yeah, yeah, well, that would be my comment. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's an interesting topic for, for further discussion. Hmm. Uh, Linda, do you have any comments? Uh, yes, no, it was very interesting to also see your viewpoint. And, and I definitely agree with this coalition building as being a really important part of it. Um, I think we, like you point out, uh, you know, like doing just what we are doing alone, like just having people get arrested is obviously not enough, like that's not what we can lean on. Um, but we argue that we kind of need the whole specter of people, you know, from all, you know, the people just like actually publishing papers. It's not like we can stop doing that, but we also need people to step up and say like, this is absolutely crazy people you have to listen um so i really appreciate uh, your viewpoint there uh, and i think building coalitions really is uh, what's <clears throat> gonna you know create this change like you say um and we've tried to do that a bit in Trondheim, like i mentioned with the other uh, climate groups and i think that the reach you have is just so much greater when there's a unified voice speaking like that so it's uh, it's really nice to to see that that's also what you bring up um yeah it was really fun to see okay thank you so now the audience do we have questions both online and here in uh, in person yes yep you can start with uh, what you said thanks for a uh, really nice and getting talks um since you brought up the energy transition conference and ntnu I'm reminded of uh, of a remark by someone before taking the stage saying it's four o'clock. Uh, now they can let the critical social scientists uh, have a word. Um, uh, since we heard from, you know, petrol justification uh, uh, proponents for several hours. So when you intervene, um, whether as part of the program or uninvited in that kind of uh, forum, my question is, do you see that as part of your risk of also um, centering things around these platforms that are provided? So you're engaging you're resisting those politics, but that engagement itself is also a form of legitimation of a particular kind of event. There's a conversation we've had over the years at SET. I'm sorry, it was a bit hard to hear. You said it, by engaging, do we see it as, as, I'm sorry, could you just repeat that last part? Is okay. there a risk of also legitimating that kind of platform as okay. opposed to uh, investing in other fora than ones that are so led by, uh, colored by incumbency of various sorts. Yeah, okay, I think I understand. Yeah, so um, we've also experienced where we sort of get invited as, like, so yeah, this year, the Energy Transition Conference actually invited us to, to have a stand there. Um, and I think in many cases, that is them trying to, uh, you know, like show that they care and invite us and hopefully prevent us from doing something disruptive, um, but also uh, showing that that uh, the climate activists have a voice there. And I do think that showing up for some of these things sometimes can 
um, get close to this line a little bit. Uh, if if our only stage is to uh, speak uh, at a stand that maybe people aren't even very interested in in coming to, then that's also a bit scary, like you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really fun when we get invited to things like this where it feels like people come here with good intentions and and of course like I don't know you guys all but uh, it feels a bit simpler in a way um because we really do see this a lot where we're given a microphone and then nobody still listens to it um yeah I hope that answered your question thank you any other questions yes maybe you can present yourself um, my name is Jan Rovibicon. I work on climate justice and I'm also writing some reports for court cases uh, against companies or countries. And uh, so I heard different aspects of um, involvement as scientists. So I heard scientists as, a, as an individual, as a citizen, and doing nonviolent uh, demonstration. I heard scientists also uh, here when you mentioned Chateau de Court cases as a legal definition of what science is. It's not science per se in the form of truth, it's expertise before a court. And here, um, what it needs is a proof for feeding a legal process. It doesn't need to be the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's only defined within the challenge of the two parties. So you don't need to establish a truth. You just need to shed light on a dispute. And it's not also based on peer-reviewed publication. It's based on the authority of the person, um, so taken as an expert, whether it's a scientist or not. And so this is where I would maybe also um, challenge the fact that we don't need more facts. I think it can be a strategic publication, a strategic um, view of, of uh, uh, producing peer-reviewed material to feed, whether it's to feed uh, legislative processes, public discourse, or even court cases, um, because some of them also rely on scientific literature. So I think there can also be a stream here in the strategization and the prioritization of the different studies we do uh, in order to make the transition. And I would see the uh, activism, so to say, of scientists being uh, not just outside their role as uh, part of universities and as producers of knowledge, but even in there, we could, uh, we could Strategize yeah, the production, the production of peer reviewed paper, if not facts. All right. Would you like to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Answer? Sure. I mean, I, I do agree with you. I mean, I also said that we cannot abandon science, right? We, we even as you act as a, a as an activist, you should also be able to make your argument in whatever scientific terms you use, whether you're a, a you know climate scientist or a sociologist. You should be accountable to your peer community. Otherwise, you don't have a basis for what you're doing. I mean, that's where you get your authority from. So that's really important. And of course, if we talk about climate change, I'm, I'm not against producing new facts about, I mean, how the situation is evolving. Of course, of course. Uh, my, my question is more about the strategy of action that, that has been intrinsic to, for instance, the emergence of climate science on the on the political scene. This idea and the policy arrangement that is so deeply embedded, at least in Western um, institutions, that science produce the facts, the politicians, they decide what is to be done. I think this model is, is kind of broken. We need something else. And this is why, uh, uh, well, scientist rebellion is, is one response to that, I think because it doesn't really work. Also, if you look at the Norwegian institutions, we recognize that climate, climate change is real. Still, it, what do we do? We act as if it's not. We keep pumping up oil, you know? So it's, it's a totally uh, schizophrenic uh, institutional arrangement that is increasingly colliding with the science. So you have increasingly scientists who are really, really dissatisfied with the state of our institutions. And, and so really the, the problem here is not so much with the science, the problem is really about the institutions and how do you take uh, various scientific findings into action? We, I, I think that's kind of... Yeah, uh, we need to wrap up, but I just wanted to ask you, Linda, if, if you have a short comment to, to Jan's question. 
I think that was beautifully answered by Cecil. Thank you so much. Okay. Then we, then we unfortunately have to wrap up this part. Uh, <laughs> mental note to have two sessions next mm -hmm. year. <laughs> uh, I move to our second part of the session. Thank you, Cecil and uh, Linda. Okay, a little scene change. Um, June, yes. Can you tell me when we're? Uh, yes, I will just uh, ready. Pin. I feel like, uh, yeah, I'm staring my back towards you a little bit. If you want to move, you're up a bit. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the second part of this event. Um, we will now focus on the practical aspects of uh, activism in uh, research or combining activism and research. Um, yeah. And to do that, we have uh, three panelists today, one joining us online, two uh, physically here at SET. Uh, and what these uh, researchers have in common is that they all uh, work in both research and maybe more politically charged or activist uh, spaces at the same time. Um, I'll just briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Christine. I am a PhD candidate here at SET. Um, outside of the academy, I have engaged in uh, nonviolent direct action uh, for a couple of years now with different environmental movements. And I'm also a co-founder of a local community organization which works to create sustainable alternatives to fast fashion. Um, and I'd like to introduce myself as an activist first and foremost, um, because I think it is my desire for a more sustainable and inclusive and fair world that informs both my research and my work outside the academy. Uh, so I feel like the term activist kind of captures it all. Um, yeah, but today's not about me. Uh, <laughs> it's about these three uh, researchers and fellow activists. Uh, firstly, we have here Anand Gopal, who is a PhD candidate at the Bergen Center for Ethics and Priority Setting uh, under the Faculty of Medicine. Then we have uh, Kerry Misanchoru, uh, Professor of Climate Dynamics at Bjergne Center and the Department of Earth Science, also at UIB. And online we have Mikael berg um, researcher at the Center for Welfare and Labor Research at Oslo Met. Um, thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, yeah. So I just wanted to start by asking you, um, yeah, I just told people about your affiliations, but that's not, that's not the only thing we're interested in today. We're really interested in what you do outside of the academy as well. Um, so I thought maybe you could all take a minute or two to explain your relationship to the terms researcher and activist. Um, do you use them to describe yourself, uh, to describe your work? In what ways and why uh, or why not? Um, we can start with you, Anna. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thank you so much for welcoming me here. Um, it's a it's an interesting one. I suppose the way I came to think about activism first and foremost was a few years ago. I know it's some of my friends and colleagues started using activists in their uh, bio, not just in their social media or something. This was in academic papers. I started to get kind of curious about that. My background is in medicine we are very action oriented. I've always been taught in that way that we do things. We think about them a bit, but mainly it's towards action. So I guess I've always had that inclination that when I moved into academia four years ago now, I was very much going there to do something. The idea of just producing knowledge for knowledge's sake is just was very alien to me. So in a way, I kind of have a lot of kind of sympathy with the idea of being an activist and characterizing myself in that way. But I actually don't in, in regular terms. I just found that it's a term that got placed on me. And this actually got placed on me at my midway evaluation of my PhD, where the examiner, of course, the one who decides whether I pass or fail, asked me, are you a researcher 
or an activist. Mm -hmm. This sort of dichotomy. And I had to give an answer. And I suppose that over the last couple of years, I've been thinking more and more about that question. Am I a researcher or am I an activist? Is that a false dichotomy? Of course, I think it is. And I think we'll discuss that. Um, but that's sort of my journey. That's a little intro. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I, have, I can recognize some of what, what you're saying there. And I, um, I think when Jana asked, you know, do you want to be a part of this discussion uh, about a scientist as an activist, I said, uh, well, I'm a scientist, I'm, I'm active in politics and you know, social discourse, but I haven't thought of myself as an activist. So this is actually like, today is coming out of scope. I'm coming out of scope. Merging from the top, you know, I'm an activist. Actually, I kind of like that. Uh, and uh, maybe that to me then realizes, you know, this thinking about it since uh, yesterday or a few days, it's like, uh, yes, I think we as scientists, and this was explained by Shepard and others, have a, a, a responsibility to use our knowledge in, in every way we can. And uh, so I have been active in, in many fora, but I, you know, I've been a climate scientist for 25 years. And that was because I am interested in nature and climate and how it's changed and, you know, observing it as a, all of you, trying to understand it. Uh, once I feel, felt I understood it, then it's a question, what, what next? You know, I can keep publishing papers, I can keep teaching, and, you know, I teach a lot of the new scientists and, and kind of what do I tell the generation of new scientists? And lately I started teaching uh, sustainable development and, and this climate action or uh, the on sustainable development goal number 13 and i get asked often so what can we do and, and then i start thinking about what do i do and and then some of this is maybe in in reality activism being active in in the political discourse being active in your small little community in the broader city in the national internationally and then uh, being active uh, kind of on the personal level so i can think of several activities that I have that actually turn out in reality as we're actors and, and I should be and I am proud of it. mm -hmm. but it's something I never took that word in my mouth before so yeah. it's very much the same as what we were describing I think yeah because you you work as a professor of course but yeah. outside of that you're also active within a political party right yeah yeah um you've joined climate protests yeah uh, out on the streets and um you also work with local communities that you do research with. Uh, does that sort of encapsulate uh, yeah. the activism that you do? Or... I, well, I mean, I've been in protest and um, I was maybe a little bit envious of some of the students. I was in a workshop in New York, just as an example, in 2019. You know, there was this big agenda, of what are called the big uh, assemblies of the UN, and, and then suddenly everybody left because it was Friday. And I realized, shit, I'm leaving also. So we all left and went out on the streets, and this is the big, you know, Battersea Power Park uh, demonstration with, I think it was 70,000 or maybe even more, hundreds of thousands of people on the street. And it was an incredible feeling, being part of that as, you know, a scientist, as a natural scientist, we were the boring, boring people sitting there in front of our computer and calculating stuff, and I'm a natural scientist, we're not out on the street. But uh, yeah, and that, that, that's a, an example of this. And working with the communities or in local politics is very much part of that. Yeah, and Anon? When you describe yourself as an activist, is that mostly within the academy, or are there also things that you do outside of the academy that you would describe as activism? Well, I suppose it's like the way I describe my activities, I think are totally reasonable. But I have a co-supervisor who's a philosopher of science, who's kind of encouraged me to think about these in a slightly deeper way. And actually come to realize that some of the claims that I'm making and premises that I start from are judgments of my own. And I guess I've come to embrace those value judgments. So for example, there could be things like writing an editorial in a medical journal. So my audience that I'm trying to target is generally the medical community. I'm trying to get those people to sort of pay attention, think this is relevant. So that could be writing an editorial there. Um, now, the kind of the way I'm presenting the argument is of course hinged on my thesis and the work I'm doing, the research I do. But these are broader claims. These are bigger yeah. claims you know, about what we should do. Uh, they're not rooted in science as such. These are rooted in values and yeah. what I think it is to be adopted, to be a researcher. Yeah. So some of my work ended up being channeled into this question of 
I was interested in the transition towards a, a low carbon net zero health system. Now, this isn't a really a value that health systems have tended to take particularly seriously, even if there are some pledges on paper. But with some colleagues, we set up a project, funded actually with some small money from the SET Accelerator Program. And uh, we started to look, it was called Grent Helsvesten, and we looked at how do we bring together people from across Norway who are interested in this issue, and how do we try and just find some solutions? It, in a way, we just gave a platform, but it ended up being really popular. We would write several articles in newspapers, journals, we would be doing interviews, we produced a report, it was covered on NRK. Yeah, now, just... ultimately, this actually isn't science as such. We used our academic convening power to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And we were admittedly trying to make a difference. We contributed to political hearings. We spoke to politicians. You know, this is beyond the everyday. Yeah, but it's and, interesting yeah. To, to see sort of the different way that one can be active as a, as a scientist within sort of the academy and also outside. Uh, Miguel, would you like to introduce yourself and uh, your relationship to these terms? Well, I was an activist before I became an academic and researcher. So I came in through that, I guess. Um, I was active in various organizations uh, before I even started taking a, any kind of university education. But it's always been actually pretty important for me to keep those two roles completely separate, at least earlier. Because I find that they are, even if they are maybe less different than the uh, people have been saying they are still quite different. I mean, for example, when I represent an organization, I'm not just talking as myself. I'm when you when you're talking about as a researcher, then you're supposed to be talking about the truth. You're supposed to be presenting a truth. And if you're voicing an opinion, then it's, it's supposed to be strictly your own. But if you're there as a representative of an organization, then you're giving voice to an entire platform. So it's two different, very different ways very different two very different roles to have i suppose so i've always been trying to cultivate a sort of separation between those two things so that when i write and talk as a researcher <clears throat> then people need to know that and when i'm talk when i talk and write as an activist for a party or an organization then people need to be completely aware of that and that is i think that is something that is owed to an audience that you you tell people who you are and who you represent. That being said, um, there is also the fact that I think we all here are aware of that research doesn't come out of nothing. It doesn't come out of neutrality. That the way we think about things, our opinions and identities do affect why we choose to do research on the subjects we choose and what kind of sources are even available to us and how we understand them, what we consider to be good outcomes. And these are things I find that we need to be more open about to our readers and the people we are talking with, that we owe it to that audience to be clear about what is our point of departure when we do research, so that we need to be more clear about what our subjectivity consists of. But I think we can do that without calling ourselves activists as researchers. I think that is, in a way, just good methodology and good dissemination technique as researchers to be aware of and to communicate well what is our point of departure, what is our subjectivity. But then again, last fall, I became involved in a project that does blur completely the border between activism and research and even art, maybe, which is the Elsa Lauler Enberg Institute project. So that's an entirely different thing, but it's going to take a while to explain what exactly that is and isn't. So, uh, Maybe that's not for a brief introduction. Yes. <laughs> now we will definitely touch upon that later. Thank you for your uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, I would like to go a little bit deeper into some of your experiences with research and activism, uh, but you should feel totally free to respond to each other as well. Uh, Karim, uh, maybe start with you, um, because you are the only one here from, an, from the natural science faculty. Um, and the scientific tradition, uh, sort of the, the positivist framework that um, yeah, places great importance on objectivity, um, is stronger in the natural sciences than anywhere else, arguably. 
uh, how did you get on this path uh, and how do you sort of navigate the natural sciences as as an activist or as someone who does activism on the side as well? Yeah, it's actually been quite difficult because um, my education has been physics and you know, climate physics and then doing climate research and everybody in my field, which is natural sciences, are or most of them are very uh, hesitant or even negative to getting involved in any public debate or any definitely activism or even originally 25 years ago being part of outreach, which we now, you know, in Norway, it's, it's required of a professor to be part of the, the disseminating your science. But in, in the US where I did my studies, I'm Norwegian, but went to the US, it was uh, kind of frowned upon a little bit that why would you um, take part in, um, you know, there's other people who should do that job of, of making, bringing the science to the public, which is, you know, that that's, I think, ancient uh, thoughts uh, that probably don't exist or not in Norway. But but then also there was a lot of negativism in the sense of um, when you are in the media, uh, you know, you have to be there's careful. And like Mikkel says, you know, objectivity, um, stating where you come from, uh, you're there as a representative of the science, you're not representing yourself, and you can only answer certain questions and not any question. And, and def definitely as a natural scientist, you stick to the, to the science and nothing else. And if you want to tell a story to engage people, that doesn't work. <laughs> it's boring. Uh, I mean, I can, I can maybe not even in a court case uh, is that a requirement? I understand. So I pretty quickly understood that uh, I can, I can state when I'm talking based on uh, literature. I will even refer to where it comes from. But I am myself as you know the person with a knowledge from both sides, from politics, from being a father, from being a educator and, and uh, you know, being part of the, the, the culture and everything. And I think that's important that we are also as natural scientists able to be part of the public discourse or as an activist, an activist uh, as yourself. And that people should accept that. And then of course, uh, there are circumstances when we have to be very clear where, where the knowledge that we are you know, stating uh, a, a fact from science where it comes from. This is, you know, I know that temperatures increase by 1.3 degrees because of this and that, or something about, you know, actual physical change. But it, it, it this is something that's been difficult to balance. And I think from Mikkel, there were some really nice perspectives on this. There's still a debate, I think. And within natural science, um, if you want to become a, um, you know, a, a leading research group of about 100 polar scientists, it's often from the point of the question whether I can do that if I am uh, active mm -hmm. in public debate. Can you be a director of a research institute if you're active in public debate? In natural sciences, the answer is often no. Yeah. So what, what do you say? I'm so much frustrated when I hear this from my colleagues. You know, you shouldn't be active in public debate because or in, you should be active in, in the different fora mm -hmm. or, or be active um, publicly um, because you're representing a research institution and, and therefore you know you're, you're in a position of a lot of responsibility and I, I got quite upset because it is our constitutional right to take part in the public debate and so I actually decided I think after some time thinking about this I would rather go that other road you know, if it requires me to have less formal responsibility so be it I think it's more important to be part of the public debate um, to contribute to be active rather than to feel constraints in, in any way, mm -hmm. in the way that I voice my concerns. Yeah. So in a way, this um, um, these comments have sort of fueled your activism. <laughs> or, uh, uh, yeah, very, activism. very much so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, then uh, Anna, uh, you're at the medical faculty. Um, do you in any way share some of these challenges that getting outlines? Yeah, I, reckon, I recognize those. I think it's just worth like pulling out something that I think activism can either have positive connotations in some circles and negative connotations in others. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'd probably in the medical faculty is closer to the negative that you're mm -hmm. describing. Um, at the same time, activism, when we mention the word, it kind of means something different to people, which might explain those different connotations. 
So although we're we've told we heard earlier about activism in the form of you know big up blockades and streets and sort of public protests getting arrested, that that is one form. I think it is actually somewhat one of our clear prerogatives as researchers is to choose what we research and decide what we research and how we ask questions, who we involve, our methods. You know, we do kind of sometimes I think there's a tendency to skip over the how pivotal and how crucial that step is. And it's not really activism as sort as such, but it is, it's I think it's quite close to it. And I think I have a luxury of my PhD, which is that I got my own funding. And actually the way it works in the medical faculty is you get it really as a candidate. So I just got money from the faculty and got to sort of design a project, roughly. Now that gives me a huge amount of flexibility, sort of ask questions, research, use different methods, however I really wanted to. Now that's actually not the case. Most often you have, um, there are different gatekeepers, they're normally funding agencies, which decide what they do or do not want to fund, and you're part of a bigger project. No, no, just all of that is to say that this challenge of people kind of having to justify your decisions to others is not one I've had to face so much yet, but I imagine it will come more and more in the future when going for jobs and other things. And that for me is one of the big challenges I think people find in academia is um, job career progression. People say, well, is that good for your career? Are you sure? Mm. You know? And so in a way, we actually uh, police one another. So the academe kind of has this tendency to hold one another back. Maybe that's good at sometimes where a peer community, as Sheffield alluded to. So maybe that serves a function, but is it serving the function right now that we want it to serve? In a way, this session could be seen as a counterweight to that, where we do not, yeah, where we call each other to responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to do the opposite. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for highlighting that. Uh, so this flexibility that you're describing and what you want to write about as a PhD candidate, uh, is that also what allowed you to write this paper about research and activism uh, published at the end of last year? Are you a researcher or an activist navigating tensions in climate change and health research in the Journal of Climate Change and Health? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have the freedom to write about that. In fact, I've written two papers during the PhD, which are kind of closer to this theme. One was actually, I, I got some help from a couple of people here, including Sid, was about the Norwegian Oil Fund and the role of future generations within it. Quite unusual for someone at the Faculty of Medicine to be writing about that. And also this, are your researcher or activist paper? And I think it's like, so to some degree, not having to hold yourself accountable to anyone, beyond a suit, maybe, maybe a supervisor, who sort of gives the nod and says that's that's good you know mm -hmm. but i'm a very encouraging supervisor so i guess maybe not all supervisors would have done that but i think in that paper it just the thing about writing something i think as a researcher is it i try to think through the problem on all the all of its layers see what other people are saying and writing about it and i think it helped me sort of crystallize my own view so maybe that's the so, best practice for the audience. I, you're confused about your role, just right now. I, I think so, yeah. <laughs> it's actually, um, yeah, maybe that's not for everyone, but I do genuinely think it is maybe worthwhile doing. Mm -hmm. Also, maybe this thing about legitimacy among your peers, again. Well, look, now I've put it out there. I've said, look, this is, I basically said, I started the paper with this critique I got in my midway evaluation. And I sort of worked it through and came to a conclusion at the end. So now if someone questions me, I can kind of run through that paper in a way, or I can even give it to them. Um, and in a way, it's sort of like an internal legitimacy, I think, actually, kind of showing your reasoning, showing yeah. your working. It's the, it's a form of transparency as well, yeah. as Mikael uh, yeah. highlighted, that, uh, yeah, describing your position, your background, the ideas that led you to writing the paper the way or researching this topic the way you've done. Yeah, actually, maybe I should emphasize something as well. Maybe it's kind of obvious for a lot of people who are in the social sciences mm -hmm. that this sort of idea of positionality and explaining where you come from is, is really core to this kind of research. In medicine, that is not core. Mm -hmm. That is, I mean, you never read a positionality statement. So this sort of idea of being transparent is um, kind of unusual. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think, do you also? Uh, agree that maybe bringing this discussion of positionality into the natural sciences might be the way forward? 
Yeah, and I, I think we have a lot to learn because often you sit in your own little bubble and, and you don't realize, you know, this whole world out there. And I think uh, it's just being here and listening and learning and, and makes it much more, you know, you you sort of realize, oh, you know, this is this is something we can do together. It's not uncommon in other fields and, and how to approach it, like also scientifically. But what I was going to say, when replying to you is, you say, you know, the the where are you in academic life, right? Mm -hmm. Are you a professor, a research leader, you know, have big projects and you've kind of done everything, kind of finished? You you don't have anything to lose. I don't have anything to lose, mm -hmm. really. Um, but I, I, so I feel I have a role rather to to make sure that the, the younger generation feels supported in, in you know, stepping into this a little bit, to, to go in a little bit out of the box and seeing what's there and what are, is our role in society. And and uh, again, I can see that that's something people, like you mentioned here, a bit uh, feels a bit risky because you're, you might close some opportunities for it down the road. So 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 that's a bit worrying to hear. At the same time, I guess it's a call to action for the senior people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on to uh, Miguel, you already uh, teased us a little bit uh, by talking about the new project or institute that you started, um, which blurs the lines between activism and research. Uh, could you tell us a bit? I, I assume you were talking about the Elsa Lala Redberg Institute. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how this initiative started and how it intersects intersects with uh, activism? Well, yeah, it was during the Folsom protests last fall when uh, there were three of us who were participating in uh, the demonstrations as just private individuals in our free time. Uh, Eva Fjellheim, Henrik Sattler, Ellingsen and me. Uh, who at some point began to talk about the fact that we were all researchers, academics, and if there was some way we could participate in the demonstrations with that competence, with the competence that uh, this gives us. And to understand why we began to talk about that at all, I think you need to know about the Elsa Laulerenberg Sida, which was the name given to the protest camp outside parliament. Uh, where everyone had been encouraged to contribute to building up a small society in the ways that they could to bring their own competences to the camp and make it develop into a small uh, temporary community. So as researchers, we decided that we could set up our own institute, so to speak, within the Elsa Laula Renberg Sida, which became the Elsa Laula Renberg Institute. And it fulfilled a particular role which was actually quite necessary. The thing was that because there is so little knowledge about the indigenous Sami in Norway, generally, people kept coming to the protest camp and asking the people there basic questions about Sami history, politics, society, reindeer herding law, and just anything that crossed their mind, which was actually disrupting the protests. So, of course, you can understand why people would want to take this opportunity to learn something about the Sami. Uh, but it was it was also at the same time something that took away the attention from what the demonstrators were there to actually do. So what the three of us did was that we also connected with other researchers and we set up a physical institute, so to speak, in a tent uh, where we always had researchers present. And we told the other demonstrators that the people came with questions. Uh, just general questions about Sami things, uh, they could send them to us. And uh, then, the, and that was what happened. Uh, everyone who came to the camp just with general questions about the Sami and uh, technical questions about reindeer herding or history or politics on a broader scale, they would be sent to our tent and we would send, we would stand there and uh, give them the answers to the extent that we could give them the answers, help them find other information and this began to grow. People came with literature and we devised curricula and there were some improvised lectures being held also. So it became quite a, quite an active little institute for as long as the protests were ongoing. Yeah. And I think we also managed to not just bring out the knowledge that we have, but also to sort of defuse a few situations because well, some people, most people came there with a basic, uh, basically supportive attitude. There were also some people who came there to argue. But uh, it's it's one thing to meet an activist who just argues against you. 
And it's another thing to meet an, a researcher who tries to have an open-ended conversation with you. So a lot of the people who came angry to our little tent walked away quite walked away quite cold. So it was mm -hmm. an interesting little experiment, all in all. Yeah. Well, so researchers can actually have a de-escalating role at the protests in a way. Uh, yes. Yeah. That is pretty much what we did. We disseminated our knowledge in a way that de-escalated and also diverted what was a disturbing element from the rest of the activism while in a way actually just doing our job. We were yeah. talking about our lines of research. Yeah. And as far as I've understood it, um, the Elsa Lala Hamburg Institute, it, it originated at the Pusen protests. Uh, yeah, this is, this is when it happened. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not something that you've... Um, sort of put down now that the protests uh, or this part of the protests have ended. Uh, I've seen some statements online uh, about, uh, for example, the situation in Gaza. I've seen uh, an article that you wrote together with the two other founders of the Institute about, uh, yeah, which relates to larger indigenous perspectives on doing research, the importance of uh, relationality and subjectivity. Um, what What's next for the Elsa Lala Lemberg Institute or well, as yeah. you say, we have continued to exist as an informal network of uh, researchers and knowledge holders um, who want to somehow contribute in the Poulsen case and cases that are similar enough. Um, yeah. So, and we have some uh, ideas lined up for the coming year that you may, you will see us when you see us. <laughs> Thank you. Keeping us uh, on the edge of our seats. Um, I was thinking you you do research into uh, indigenous politics and Sami politics. Um, do you think that activism plays a special role in uh, Sami research, um, given the the decades of of harmful research or research that has not benefited Sami communities um, from a reconciliation perspective or a, a perspective to decolonize the academy? Can we see? activism or engagement in the fight for Sami rights as a sort of prerequisite for researchers doing uh, Sami research? Well, in a way, the research on the Sami has always been activist because it has always had some political point to it. I mean, even when he, during the Norwegianization phase, when during the phase of history where we had active, active Norwegianization policy, then the researchers were the agents of Norwegianization. So yeah. it has always had some political point to it. It has always been colored by the researchers' political attitudes and the view of the Sami. You can't do research on the Sami without having some view on the Sami that shapes how you do your research. So it's not a matter about having a point of view or not. It's about, as far as I can see, it being open about what your point of view is. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think there's this more, less of a problem in humanities and the social sciences these days and maybe in other disciplines, because, I mean, when you do research on some field of policy, then people are going to assume that you are interested in this field of, field of policy because you think it's important. And if you think it's important, then you probably have a point of view. So then your task is pretty much just to make it clear what your point of view is. And that is something you owe to your audience and also to your informants, in my point of view. But of course, that is sort of risky because when you arm your informants with the knowledge about what you think about the field of policy you're studying, then they can talk to you in ways that are strategic. They can be less open to you when they know what you think about the field of policy we are talking about here. But maybe that is something you owe to your informants. Maybe you should arm them with that knowledge. Because what you do as a researcher is important. The output you write is going to be important. So maybe it's just fair that they know. Yeah, thank you. Um, time is flying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I will just ask you one last question, uh, and then we have about five minutes uh, for questions from the audience. Um, what do you think is needed to get more people, um, or let's make it very concrete, uh, the people sitting here, um, more active political agents in societies as researchers. Um, is there something that the university, UIB, Oslo Met, or any research institution could do to facilitate for more uh, politically engaged research? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, let me be brief then. Um, I think university has a key role. Look, a place like University of Bergen talks a lot about actionable knowledge. I think actually uh, we do need to talk about exactly what that means. I think places like SET are pretty, you know, great place, great spaces for this. Um, and it would be good just to sort of spread it out over across the whole university. Um, I guess I was thinking about people in this room. It is good to think about activism as many things. And, um, you know, I've decided that my kind of activism is targeted towards my own peer community. Um, it doesn't always have to be fully public facing kind of out on the street. It's, you know, think about what you can do and where you can make an influence uh, on the individual level. Thank you. Jenny? Yeah, I'm sitting, sitting here thinking and looking at the whole of our there back because, I mean, it, it's something, it has to be something real. Normally, Mikkel had a really nice example. Use your knowledge to support activism, to support, you know, with knowledge, with kind of pinpointing, this is really important. We need to change this because, or when I, I'm thinking about Hobart, because I came into the building and, and looked at the energy uh, rating for this building, and it's really bad. It got an F. <laughs> I was like, oh, this, is, this is terrible. So I, I'm wearing a, 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 a uh, woolly uh, sweater from my mother, but I think uh, the temperature is still 22. We should, you know, we're wasting all energy here. So we can do something about that. I mean, it's just about the knowledge to act and then to come, and I think, constructive way with solutions, because I think that's where science comes in. Thank you. Miguel? Well, I think I'm privileged enough to work at a place where we are encouraged to participate in public debate. So uh, I don't know. But it maybe that maybe that what we've got going is sort of part of the solution then to just have a culture where researchers are encouraged to always participate in public debate, and also are given courses on how to write in a way that it, well people can understand what we're saying because that doesn't come naturally to uh, everyone who's been through the university and learned how to write in that way because that's not the way you write when you talk to people, that's not the way you write when you try to disseminate your knowledge to a broader audience. You can't write an article. So uh, to have institutes cultivate a culture where it's expected to participate in public debate and to also maybe help people be able to do that by providing courses. Those are very concrete measures that have been taken at least. And then I think we all need to be, maybe ask ourselves, why is it that we have ended up studying the things we're studying? What, why do we think it is important? What, what is it that we want to change or preserve? What is our opinion? Because we all have an opinion. Maybe we're, aware, maybe we're not aware of the fact that we do have an opinion, but we do have an opinion. And we do need to be honest with everyone about what that is. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think we can move on to questions from the audience. Have any? Yes, yeah. Yeah, I would... Uh... I would like to hear the opinions on maybe more institutional uh, transformation, maybe beyond the university itself. We saw some problems with the impact assessments or the lack of climate targets. And I think here it's easy for all of us to be activists in the sense that we want more climate action. But when the question will come of which action, then we might not all agree. And the idea of being an activist against one another won't be as simple. So the question is, how do we change uh, institutional accounting of evidence uh, so that we can have collective discussion as to how we use the science and make sure that it's relying on with science? I, I think here we're really at the first step, um, and I would be curious mm -hmm. yeah, to hear um, how to advance on the institutional beyond the university. Yeah, uh, maybe we just let you ask your question and then. So I, I really like that point. I think uh, so I was talking more about institutional settings and, and, and about institutional mechanisms that don't work any longer. We need to change them, right? So this is why we need people like you that we have been listening to. Uh, we need people who are pushing at the boundaries and trying to set up new arrangements. So we heard about Mikkel, he was actually setting up, it, it's a knowledge mediating kind of mini institution that you set up there, I think, in, in that tent. And you can also find similar examples from Extinction Rebellion. They set up online forums where they actually mediate knowledge and they, they will send people here and there and so on. So it, it's, it's really a hybrid kind of institution. It's not science, 
but it's, it also includes science. So it's these kinds of interfaces that, that we need to build in an institutional level, I think, uh, as well. Okay. But it's possible. Yeah, we have a question online. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's Joran. Uh, did you want to say your question or should I read it? Oh, you can unmute yourself. There we go. Yes. Hi. Well, uh, I don't think we can hear you. No sound. No sound. No sound. Okay. So maybe we can read the question if uh, you wrote it. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this um, I might be here now. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll be quickly. As um, I'm currently working outside of academia, but did my master's thesis at set. I'm wondering what pressures the panel members experience from society for researchers to be or rather not be activistic, and whether these pressures are help helpful or not. Um, Anybody want to answer that? Pressures or thresholds? What did you say? Pressures. <laughs> pressures. Yeah, so pressures from outside of academia to the activists. I, I was going to say that I think their pressures from outside are more positive, <clears throat> encouraging, and, and um, quite grateful, I think, for, for being active. Uh, I was thinking more it's within the institution that's mm -hmm. maybe the issue. And I think a bit of the answer, maybe not to you, because you asked about well, outside the institution, but within the institution, I think, interdisciplinarity, meaning transdisciplinarity, not like between biologists and physicists, but mm -hmm. it, it broadens our picture and our understanding of our relevance, our importance, our potential contribution. And well, of course, the run we have a linguist and a physicist talking together. And normally that doesn't happen before in the fourth year, maybe in the, if, if, at, ever in a scientific career in, in the university setting or at educational setting. And I think that that's something that we really need to make happen more often mm -hmm. so that that discourse starts and that we inspire each other to, to be active, to take action. Yeah, yeah. Also, because in a way, um, we have uh, a lot of the natural science knowledge that we need in order to uh, justify the climate or, or transformation of society. We're just not doing it yet. So I think this conversation between the natural sciences and the social sciences of how can we govern based on this knowledge that you have found? Uh, yeah, it's a really, really great step forward. Um, Miguel, raise a hand. What was or the not. question actually about um, pressure against researchers to be or to not be activistic? Was that was that what you're saying? Or In, yeah, I'm I'm wondering well, whether you yeah. feel any pressures or requests from society to be or rather not to be activistic as a researcher. Does does society reach out to academia researchers, be more activistic or rather stop researchers? I think uh, I'm, I'm personal experience and quite a healthy uh, uh, expectations that we participate in public debate at least. But uh, something that I have been noticing is that people tend to uh, decry the knowledge they don't like as being activistic. Uh, yeah. Even if it's, I mean, I've been talking a bit about something, uh, I've been talking a bit about how knowledge production does have subjectivity at its point of departure, that it, there is also always some subjective interest or opinion that fuels your research. But even so, the research you end up with, is, it is supposed to be true. And But the problem is that even things that are documentably true are brushed away as activism. Even if the researcher doesn't actually have a particularly visible political uh, activist profile, then research can be brushed off as activistic just because some people don't like the result. And I think that is a big problem for public debate. Yes, I think that's a beautiful note to end on uh, as it relates to the first point uh, raised by Chatel about uh, science losing its authority. Um, thank you all very much. I think we can do a quick round of applause. Uh, as uh, Linda Holland shared, uh, there's an NPDA training later, free to attend online, uh, hosted by Scientist Rebellion. Uh, there's also two more uh, sessions by SET uh, affiliates and employees.
Um, at 15.30, there's Charting Desirable Energy Futures by Sid and Shyam, who is joining us online. And there's, at the same time, uh, a session called Navigating the Challenges and Embracing Opportunities in Green Transition Finance, where Jan is a panelist, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So, yeah, thank you very much. Um, I hope you all come back to this after the session. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll just to ask all the